attention, I would like to welcome you to Casey Chambers Business Class. Our flight is preparing for takeoff, so please take your seats. My name is Jasmine Thompson and I'm the program coordinator with the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. Business Class is the inception of the Chamber's Small, Diverse, and Emerging Business Council, and specifically our traditional small business subcommittee. This series has been designed by small business for small business. I want to thank you all for attending today, and we hope you plan to fly with us again in the future. Please take a look at your handouts in front of you. You will see we have one final arrival for 2013, which includes aligning strategy with key initiatives. Now, before you depart your flight today, we would love your feedback. At your table, you will see survey cards. Please fill those out and leave them on the table at the end of your flight. Before I introduce our presenters, I would first like to introduce the sponsor for the 2014 Business Class Series, Time Warner Cable. Please welcome Stephen Goss and Joe Mayerly as they give welcome remarks. Well, thank you. We're, we're pleased to be uh, presenting sponsor today. We brought a little swag and, and marketing material, so before you leave, Please grab one of everything. Uh, most uh, businesses aren't aware that we're the largest provider of fiber service in Kansas City. And we actually have a one gigabit fiber pipe here at Union Station for the technology launch pad. So if, if you have the time the day before you leave, you might want to swing by there and then you can see fiber service in action and uh, what it can do for a company. Uh, we also help businesses with secure uh, Ethernet connections for multiple locations where uh, with all the electronic medical records and confidentiality uh, for compliance anymore, uh, you can have long haul uh, local area network type connections over our fiber backbone. And then we help with uh, phone service, video service, uh, manage cloud services for hosting Microsoft Exchange, data security, and disaster recovery. And we'd love to talk to you further if there's interest. We have contact information on the back table, and uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Now, I am honored to introduce our featured speakers for this flight, Carolyn Watley with CBiz and Mike DeLeo with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of KC. Our two presenters will share their expertise and knowledge on the Affordable Health Care Act. So please welcome Karen Watley and Mike DeLeo. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I just want to let everyone know Mike ran to get his glasses out of the car, so he will be right back. But I'm Carolyn Watley with CBiz, and Jasmine, I would like to ask you, if you took us on a flight, is there a reason why we landed in a place where we need ice scrapers? <laughs> oh well, I'm glad we have them if we are going to all be here, so thank you very much to Time Warner. Um, I'm excited to put one in my trunk and I will think of you. Every time I use it, I'll try not to use bad words at the same time. I'll try to just be happy about it, so thank you. And thank you all for being here. I'm sorry for those who might have your backs to us, but we'll try to um, uh, speak to you so loud enough so you can hear while you're still eating. And I thought it would be really nice, kind of while we're waiting for Mike, if we could just go around quickly and do introductions. If you could just tell us your name, your company, and how many employees at your company. That will help Mike and I when we are uh, making our remarks uh, right now. So I'll start with you. Hi, I'm a Wendy McGraw with Buttonwood Financial Group, and we're located up in Union Hill. Um, we have eight to ten working for us at our building, and many others that have been contracted outside of that. But yeah, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen Sillison with Sillison Financial, and I am the only full-time employee. Awesome. Patrick Hubbard with Halco. <clears throat> We're a small equipment company in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And? Five employees. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Brett Walker with Click Farm Interactive. We're a digital marketing design and development mm -hmm. company uh, in Kansas City. We have about 15. Dana Murray, from Missouri Bank, we currently have 87 employees. Chris Stockmeyer, I'm a Taxation Software Development Company, and we have 57 employees. So, Kathy Johnson, with Jay Schmidt, um, we're a marketing company, and we have 15 employees. Sean Berry, Logistics and Transportation Consultant, I'm with Logistics Consulting, and just me. Just you, it's good enough, right? 
<laughs> uh, Brett Shores, uh, Troy Boyd, uh, Tax Credit uh, Consulting, Economic Development, and Marianne can tell you more if you need any more information. Uh, we're about 30 people. Great. Marianne, Mr. Troy. Okay. Melinda McLaughlin, and I'm with First Response Security. We provide actual guard service, and uh, I've got about, depending on what day it is, 85-ish employees. I'm Lisa Anderson. I'm with Kim Whitmore Advertising, and I'm with about 18. Linda Northlake with Berkman Associates, uh, Media Buying and Planning, and we have 15. Dana Nolan, I'm with KNBC TV, and I'm one of Hundred, a bunch, <laughs> one of many, a couple of hundred. Joanna Sabato with KNBC TV. Uh, Christina Humphreys, KNBC. Great, thank you. And I will let Mike introduce himself. Hi, Mike DeLeo. I'm the territory sales manager with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas City, and I actually call on uh, agents that uh, sell insurance, and obviously I want them to sell Blue Cross insurance. Uh, and I work in the uh, small group market, and that's defined at Blue Cross as companies with under 100 employees. So that would include all of you. Welcome. Okay, thank you. So <coughs> Mike and I both, uh, we work together a lot, just so you know. Um, I'm with Cedas, we're an employee benefit consulting firm. The topic today is the Affordable Care Act and consultants like Cedas have been working um, and trying to understand and, and um, go through the complexities of this law and learn it to be able to communicate it, to understand it ourselves and communicate it to our clients. And we've really been doing this for three years now and it hasn't changed. Every day is a new day. Every day is something new to learn. It's very complex, so we understand. We continue to have questions. We know you all have a lot of questions. And we're trying to think about it. We're at that very crucial time where um, October 1st was the first date for individuals to sign up for health, cover health insurance coverage if they didn't have it, and so we've all heard a lot about that in the news. So um, Mike and I are prepared to go through presentations, but I thought I would just kind of start with a little bit of kind of what's happening right now, and then also ask you if you would prefer, if you would like for us to answer your questions, we're happy to do that. Since there's a small group, we can be more intimate and really answer the questions that are on your mind, and or go through our presentations, which might have a lot of the answers as well. So I'm just going to kind of make a few opening remarks, and then I'll get your feedback after that. And um, as I mentioned, uh, right now, individuals can shop for individual coverage and learn whether they are eligible for a subsidy. So for the first time ever, there are subsidies available for certain individuals. There's a requirement that everyone have um, health insurance, and there is a subsidy for those who are 400% of poverty to 100% of poverty, essentially. So uh, people right now are wondering, where do I get this insurance, and do I, am I eligible for a subsidy, and how, how does that um, correlate with any other coverage that I might have or be eligible for. So those are the kinds of things that are right now. If employee, if individuals don't have insurance, they are required to pay a fine, which would be paid next year when you file your income taxes. So it would be next April. If you would, if you don't have coverage during 2014, the following April is when you would be paying this fine. There is transitional relief available to individual if your employee, if you work for an employer who doesn't have a calendar year plan year you can delay your requirement for individual insurance till the beginning of that plan year for the employer. So that is also something that's just kind of right now during this first year. As you know, there are issues with healthcare.gov that are preventing some people from enrolling who are trying to enroll, and we are all hearing every day in the press how that's going, and they've brought in all kinds of IT experts for a tech surge to help get everything going again. I don't think anyone at this particular moment knows exactly how long it might be before those issues are resolved. So if anyone, it's anyone's guess at this point, and we're all just going to watch it together and kind of see how that goes. Um, the also insurance policies that are effective of January 1 of 2014 are required to have certain insurance marketplace reforms. And so there are certain uh, mandated provisions in an insurance contract that are, that are effective January 1st of 2014. So you might be hearing in the news, oh, someone can't keep the policy that they had, or you know that, that it was said that if you like the policy you have or the insurance you have, you can keep it, but now people are finding out there are changes to their contracts or their contracts are no longer available. Mike will be a great person to talk about that from the insurance carrier perspective, how they've had to modify their contracts because they're not allowed to sell certain types of coverage anymore, they're not, they are required to include certain provisions, 
they're, they're required to underwrite a certain way now, and so things aren't the way they used to be, even though there's a thought out there that you can keep what you had, some things are different, particularly for small employers. So particularly for most everyone in this room, if you're under 100, there are, are differences going forward in terms of underwriting and those sorts of things. So you might be hearing a lot about that. Um, individual policies are available for purchase both on what is called the, the insurance exchange or the insurance marketplace. You might be hearing about a, a state or a federal exchange. And then there's, so you might be hearing about policies available on an exchange or off of the exchange. Just like today in, in, in our entire lives, you could go buy individual insurance if you elected to do so, and you can continue to buy individual insurance exactly the same way you did in the past. There's also a new way, which is the federal marketplace or the, straight, the state marketplace, which is part of the provisions of the health care reform or the Affordable Care Act. So you, the difference between buying products on the exchange or off the exchange is something that we're all trying to get a grip on and trying to understand. And for example, a carrier like Blue Cross <coughs> might decide that we're going to sell these two different policies on the exchange, but then off of the exchange, they might have a, a larger variety of policies available. So you can buy insurance <coughs> through the exchange or off of the exchange. The one big difference is, besides which products might be available on either one, is that the subsidies that certain people qualify for are only available on the exchange. So that's why right now, those who are under 400% of poverty, who are thinking, hey, I'm going to be eligible for a subsidy, they're all needing to go onto the exchange to get coverage if they want to get the subsidy that goes with it. And that's why the issue that the website is not exactly working is because you can't get the subsidy if you can't enroll, and right now there are issues getting people enrolled. Um, for people who are uh, covered through their employer, none of those issues are of concern to you because your coverage is continuing for the most part as it has in the past with whatever different provisions are now required as a result of the Affordable Care Act as well. Um, if you're looking for coverage on the exchange, and as I mentioned, Blue Cross has a couple of different policies that they're offering. In this particular region, the Kansas City region, there are a couple of carriers that are offering products on the exchange for which you could be eligible for a subsidy, and that is Blue Cross of Kansas City and Coventry. And so luckily we have Mike here who can kind of explain what that world is all about. And then again, off of the exchange, there are, besides Blue Cross and Coventry, there are some other carriers that are offering products outside of the exchange, such as Humana or United Healthcare, or those types of carriers in this region. Um, also, uh, individual policies offered on and off the exchange are required to be what is now called a metal plan, which is either bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. And so um, there's intended to be some way to be able to compare, do an apples to apples kind of comparison between uh, a bron different bronze plans and how much they cost versus gold plans, silver, et cetera. Um, the thing is, within a bronze plan, there's not just one plan design that's called bronze. It, a bronze plan needs to be a 60% actuarial value plan and it could, you can get there a lot of different ways. So you can have different policies with different types of provisions, all called bronze. And so that's making it a little complex because we're all having to learn something new. There never was such a thing as bronze, silver, gold, or platinum insurance policies before. Now there are. Now we're all having to learn what does that mean? How do I compare them? How do I compare them between carriers? Et cetera, et cetera. So this is the time when all that is just now starting. So if you're out there, you're looking around, you have a lot of questions about that, I certainly <coughs> understand that. And that's really kind of just a few tidbits on current things going on in the individual marketplace. For small employers, the reforms, so if you have a small, if you have a small plan, a small employer with a small plan, there are insurance marketplace reforms that were required to be in plans that were sold uh, for, to small groups. And there are several new provisions that are effective January 1st of 2014. And so you'll probably be hearing or have already heard about a lot of those new provisions. Some employers have decided to change their renewal date or plan year to a December 1 of 2013 in order to ward off some of those changes for another 12 months or so. So Mike can speak a lot to that. That's been his world for the last 12 to 24 months for sure. 
where employers are looking to delay what the new requirements are throughout 2014 until about the end of the year. So you're seeing a lot of that happening. Um, the definition of small group for under health care reform, as you know, um, if you have 50 or more full-time equivalent employees, you're required to offer coverage or pay a fine. That originally was going to be in effect on January 1st of 2014. That's been delayed one year to January 1st of 2015. So if you're a, if an employer that has 50 or more full-time equivalent employees, that's also new language. We've never worried about what is, what is an equivalent employee. So now you have to count all of your part-time people and add up their hours to determine how many full-time equivalents do you have. And if it's 50 or more, then you are required to offer coverage or pay a fine. If it's under 50, you're not required to offer coverage. So what yes. is the base hourly? I mean, do, is it so many hours per week then to qualify for a full-time employee? It's after you decide, after you determine if you have 50 or more, okay? okay? And that counts all hours okay. for all of your full and part-time people. After, after you make that determination, am I 50 or more or 49 or less, then you're required to offer coverage to those who work 30 or more hours per week. So 30 or more is considered full-time when you're making the determination as to who you have to cover. Those are, it's very, it's complicated because those two things, you have to kind of keep them straight. So it's 50 or more full-time equivalents to determine do you have to offer coverage or not. And again, that provision has been delayed for 12 months. So if you like to not have to worry about that for another six months or so, you can worry about that later. But a lot of employers, particularly larger employers, who have a lot of full-time or part-time employees and they don't currently offer coverage to maybe some large groups of people who work 30 or more hours a week are really trying to determine how are they going to manage through that when this provision does come back into, into effect. Is that 30 hours when you're taking all your part-time and full-time employees and dividing them out to find out how many full-time employees you have? Are you doing that on a 40 hour work week? Or are you saying, are you do, or do you use that 30 hours? You're using that? all the hours that everyone works. So if I have a part-time person that works 10 hours a week, I'm counting that, if I have 10 of those, that's 100 hours. Right. And so then I'm dividing that out to determine, is right. that? By dividing by what though? By 30 right. hours or by 40 hours? What's, what's the full calm? You take the, I'll let yeah. You, yeah. He has a little, Nice little, uh, and it, it's actually in the uh, handout for you, and it's, uh, it's uh, so of course it's very easy. <laughs> if you actually, uh, if, you, if you was to actually pull up, if everyone's curious how do you do that, pull up the Blue Cross presentation, and how is that actually laid out? They do it in multiple screens like that, so I'm not certain what page it's going to... It's page 11. Uh, page 11 on number. mine, but it, they I have mean, like... I mean, it's slide number 11. Okay. Right. There you go. One, okay. One that looks like this. And that could be, uh, boy, that could be some very small print. Yeah, that's going to be some really small print. Yeah, that's why I just now pulled mine out. I thought, and I have to pull mine out to see it on this one, let alone to see to see it right there. So what I could do for you, just to read a little bit of kind of what you were saying. If you can't read that, what it says is, step one would be determine full-time employees. Calculate the number of employees who work at least 30 30 hours a week or 130 hours in a given month, okay? Then step two, determine full-time equivalents. You add up the total hours worked during a given month for every non-full-time employee and divide by 120. Mm -hmm. It gets better. <laughs> add together the results of step one, and we didn't make this up at Blue Cross, I'm just gonna tell you, okay? Add to the results of a step one and step two. Repeat, uh, then what you have to do is then you're still in the process of determining uh, over the course of the year, repeat steps one and two and three for every month of the preceding calendar year, add up for the total of the year, divide the total from, you, you guys can read it, I'm sitting there kind of reading you something that you're probably looking at yourself. You can see though that kind of going through that process step by step is the way to determine how many full-time equivalents that you have, which then determines other things associated with the Affordable Care Act. So, I have a question. So who's monitoring that companies are doing this correctly? I mean, so is it up to the co individual company to do this and do it correctly? So then who audits that they do it correctly? And so what if... There could be audit, auditors okay, from so the Department of Labor or something like that. I would suggest 
possibly an auditor might be one of your employees who thinks they should be off, being offered coverage and aren't and might say, hey, I, I thought I was supposed to get coverage because our company blah, blah, blah. So I just suggest that while there are a number of auditors out there, you may never see one, but all of your employees who are informed might be wanting to make certain that they're getting whatever it is that they're entitled to under help under the Affordable Care Act. So I'll just keep that in mind. But I'll answer your question also from a carrier standpoint. That's kind of kind of the role that kind of what we were trying to do today is kind of give both perspectives is an insurance carrier is not going to make that determination. That's just not a role that we're going to mm -hmm. make. It would be it would be at the group level mm -hmm. and any any counsel that you would get to uh, to make that uh, determination. Okay, dokie. Um, I'll other on my notes here are um, the insurance part insurance marketplace reforms include such items as pre-existing conditions so you probably already heard that effective January 1st of 2014 there can be no pre-existing conditions exclusions for anyone under any type of contract so in the past if people were worried about pre-existing conditions those are those issues are all gone effective January 1st of this year um, there are no annual limits, so an insurance carrier can't say there's a million dollar or an annual limit on a, any type of benefit or no lifetime limits or anything like that. So in the past, you might have had a contract with a million dollar maximum lifetime or two million or some of them were unlimited. Now they're all required to be unlimited. And there are community rating requirements for, for the individuals and for the small businesses that are under 50 uh, 50 and under, actually, 50 and under employees. And so those underwriting requirements are now different than they were in the past. And I'll let Mike kind of review how that works from a carrier perspective. Well, let's just talk, let's just kind of review first of all is how do we do it today? Okay? Today, an employer would fill out uh, the employer application, then each employee would complete their own employee application with medical questions, and, and then that would be turned into the carrier. The carrier would then give it to an underwriter who would take a look and take into account all the various medical conditions within the group and, um, and then provide a rate based on, based on the information we receive. All that goes away. There's going to be no more medical questions on the uh, employee applications. It's going to be very cut and dry. It's going to be based on a, a person's age, uh, no longer the gender, that's no longer a factor, where a, person's, where a person lives, what coverage type that they have. I miss one here. Uh, and you can or can't, sometimes you can do smoker or non-smoker. That's also a part of it. So, so, and so the rates are just going to be very set in stone. What they are is what they are. It doesn't matter what condition you have or what your gender is anymore. The rates are what we file with the state. The rates are what they are. And so it kind of takes out that whole um, the whole uh, idea of medical underwriting. Now, we talked about, I, I have to just talk about, when because all the things that you're hearing about with rate increases and some things, and some shock out there on certain rates and whatnot, when we talk about um, pre-existing conditions, no more pre-existing, no one can be denied, community rating, and, and these various things, I think everyone in this room would agree that there are some good things. And I, I really do. I even myself believe that's, that's a good thing that no one could be denied and, and, and pre-ex to some extent. But what that does is, why it's, why it's then torn the other way is, that comes at a cost. That comes at a cost for the carrier. And so that's just one factor amongst many that, allow, that makes those rates actually in some cases go up for, uh, for individuals. Those carriers have to then take into account that there is no, uh, of some of those provisions that we used to have, call it today and tomorrow, it all changes. Why so, is location, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Why is location a, a factor? That's interesting, I understand age and tobacco. You know, I would suggest that um, each, in, in this area, for example, there are many hospitals you can go to and they charge a certain amount when you go there. And that can be drastically different than if I'm in St. Joe, Missouri, and I go to a hospital, it could be more expensive or less. If I'm in St. Louis, it could be different. So it's really a mix, it's a mix of the, the cost of care in that particular area. It could also be some kind of, there could be some demographics in an area that, um, like people who live in Kansas City are drastically different health-wise from people that live in another city, for example. But 
but primarily it has to do with the cost of care that's available in each of the different areas. So presumably it's going to be more expensive in New York than it is in Kansas City. We should get benefit from that. But sometimes the more hospital beds you have, um, the more uh, the cost of care is because hospitals are looking to fill those beds. And if they're not filled, they still have to pay for them. And so to some, it's, it's kind of a lot of different factors. But in the past, it used to be that you could, you could rate on gender. So females typically were charged more for health insurance because they lived, they lived longer, they had babies, those kinds of things. But now males and females will pay the same. So what that means is females will probably pay less than they had been, males would pay more. Um, when you're looking at age disparity as well, one of the underwriting requirements is that um, for the small employers and individuals as well, you can only charge the oldest person, say a 64-year-old, because 65 would be eligible for Medicare, but a 64-year-old can only be charged three times what a newborn is charged. So it used to be those, those differences in rates could be like this, and now it can only be three times. So what that means, if you, if you think about it, if the rate could be, say, 10 times higher, for example, and now you say it can only be three times higher, that means it goes like this. So the older people will pay less, yay me, and the younger people will pay more. Sorry for most of the rest of you in the room. So um, that's why people are, when, it, it's, when people are asking the question, with Affordable Care Act, does it make uh, coverage more expensive or less expensive? The answer is it depends. It depends on what you are now and maybe your own health conditions now and if you're rated up because of your health condition, maybe you're in a group of four or five where someone had cancer, so you've got a health condition within the group, maybe you're fine, but the group has had health conditions and you're paying a lot right now, that could change where you're paying less. Historically, we always think about older people paying more, younger people paying less, and while that's still the case, it's going to be less, less of a difference in it than it has been in the past. So that's why it's really hard to answer the question, should I expect my prices to be higher or lower or the same? Yeah. Again, it depends on where you are now. And some people will see two or 300% rate increases. Some people could see a rate decrease. Um, those people will be very happy. The other people might not be so happy. The good news is I think that um, there are a lot of, the, the insurance carriers have done a great job of laying out a lot of different options. So probably um, differently in the past, although in the past couple of years there have been a lot of options out there, but you'll be able to kind of customize the plan that is right for you and what you want, whether you want a high deductible or you don't. But there are still restrictions that the insurance carriers are required to comply with as part of the Affordable Care Act as well. So <coughs> there's, a, there's a maximum a deductible that you can have. There's a maximum out-of-pocket that you can have. And so the ca insurance carriers are really again, required to, um, that's another reason why people, you might be hearing that um, I can't keep the insurance that I had before. Well, if you had a deductible that was higher than what the new requirement is, then you can't keep that policy. You will have to change to something different. And so there's a lot of things happening right now. So for January 1st of 2014, a lot of things. There, there have been a lot of things that have already happened, but there are, there are a lot of things and more for the January 1 effective date. Is there so. any expectation on the carrier side that the more people that do enter these pools, that the price will moderate and kind of go down? As far as when we get more people into the into the pool, do we have an expectation that those prices will kind of go down? Well, you was gonna say something? I'm only gonna say that more young, healthy people, they yes. Get in, more cool. old, sick people, no. the opposite would happen. Right. So that's why you're hearing a lot about the big push to enroll young, healthy people. That's, that's what keeps the pool clean. That's what keeps the pool clean is that whole mix uh, of young and, and, and sick to help subsidize them all. And that's, and that's, that's really no different than what happens today. Yeah. That is what ha is exactly what happens. replicate, like, let's say what happens in Massachusetts, maybe not that high number, but if they get into the 90s with that many people are covered, do they expect that price to kind of baseline out and not raise like it does substantially kind of in the past? You know, I think, I think this is so, uh, and I'm not trying to evade the question, but I think this is so new, though, uh, to all of us. This is unprecedented, you know? And so I think, um, I think time is going to have to play itself out. Uh, healthcare.gov is not helping this process right now. 
uh, to, to make those determinations. And so, um, once again, I, I think time uh, will, will tell us all if, if are, are the younger, healthier going to join? Are, is is that, that subsidy eligibility? Are people going to just jump on board who are sick and who's been denied uh, in the past? And therefore, that pool is not good at all. And, and then what happens then? Uh, would, would rates then go even higher? The so thing, there's a lot of unknowns. The other thing right now, the fine it for not having coverage is $95 or 1% of your mm -hmm. income. So if I'm weighing, and I'm not suggesting this is a good idea, so don't hear me say this, but I'm against this totally. It's a disclaimer. But if I'm weighing, that's my disclaimer, if I'm weighing the cost of a premium versus $95, $95 is generally going to be less. That's for the first Unless, year. yeah, and it ratchets up. Um, now, there is a subsidy. So with a subsidy, I might be, so again, if I'm 400% of poverty or below, uh, between 100 and 400% of poverty, if I get a subsidy, I need to factor that in. But people say, oh, what people are going to do is just not get coverage, the young, healthy people, the invincibles, so to speak, and wait till they get sick <coughs> and then sign up. There's a problem with that. And the problem with that, and this is why I'm just saying to all your children who are young invincibles or yourself, um, that if you have a problem and you don't have coverage until you signed up, you're going to have a problem. You know, if I get in a big car wreck on the way out of here and something tragic happens, I'm not going to be covered currently. And if I can enroll at the next enrollment period, that might not be till next year. So January 1st of next year might be the first time I can get coverage and I might have a ton of expenses between now and then. So I would suggest that that's not a good strategy, but there could be a lot of people that play that. But I think as yeah. Mike said, it's gonna take time. I think, you know, don't even, I, I think we're gonna have to think about this 10 years from now and what's it going to look like and what is the change in, how many uninsured people are signing up for coverage but it's also going to turn another way and that's the employers and the employer market and the big question for employers particularly small employers to a certain degree is should we continue to offer a plan or should we tell our associates hey just go to the exchange and get your subsidy there and i think that's a big question mark uh, i tell employers all the time that i think the type of employer that are doing that might utilize that strategy are employers who uh, have employees that they might consider, you know, doesn't matter, I just need five people. Any five will do. I think that's very few types of businesses because most people need talent and they need the talent in their organization. And if you leave, uh, that's, that's a big hole because you're a valued employee and I don't want something to happen to you. So I want to be able to provide a benefit to you so that you stay. Now, I'm an employee benefit consultant, so I'm certain I'm biased in that regard, but um, it's, I, I just think that it's something to think about as you're making <coughs> decisions. We all have a lot of decisions to make. Employers have decisions and individuals have decisions as well as to what you're going to do and, and how to do it. And so with that right there, we have employers in the room and what we thought we would do is open up your specific questions. We do have a lot of information. We both have presentations. You've got information in front of you, but we thought because this uh, group got a little smaller than what we may have thought. Uh, we thought we'd, once again, <coughs> informal, and so employers have lots of questions. So we're going to open it up and just, once again, just ask you, are, are there anything that's just on your mind now with some things that we've, please, we'll just start here. Uh, from a Blue Cross perspective, what are the difference in plans offered on the exchange versus off the exchange, and are there pros and cons to either? Well, uh, the first of all, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, there are some products we are offering on the exchange off the exchange that we're not offering on the exchange. I'll first of all talk about in the individual market. In the individual market, um, we're offering fewer plans on than off, although uh, the products themselves that we are offering on and off are identical, with one little caveat. I always say, there's nothing easy. There's nothing easy. Uh, one little caveat, with, and that is the pediatric dental. Pediatric dental is a part of one of the essential health benefits. A new term that we're all used to, that there's 10 essential health benefits that have to be included in all the products. Well, you have this pediatric dental on the individual and small group market, although on the individual market, we have elected to not embed the pediatric dental on our product. So I don't mean to get in the weeds on this a little bit, but there was just a difference there, and I just feel like I, I, I'll tell you on that. But basically, they're, they're exactly the same, and the rates are exactly the same except for that 2% off the exchange with Blue Cross because of the pediatric dental is embedded or included off exchange. 
So once again, I should have simplified by saying, for the most part, the products are identical with that one caveat. In the small group market, we are only offering two products on the uh, small group exchange, small group marketplace. We're offering 12 products today off exchange. So there's a lot more variety that we're offering right now. I'll just talk real quick about the, uh, the small group exchange. Right now, you talk about some delays, there's certainly one right there. We don't even have guidance today on how everything is going to work. So today, a small employer, I couldn't even tell you how you would enroll on the shop because the guidance just isn't, it isn't there, the systems aren't, aren't quite uh, uh, there yet, and so, but once it is, we'll have two the shop products. shop is the name of the marketplace where small employers go to buy health insurance for themselves and their employees. Yeah, different than the talk, individual uh, marketplace. So but when you hear about the shop exchange, think small group, small employer. You think about the individual exchange, it's <coughs> individual, one at a time. And there might be some network differences. Blue Cross, for example, has products that have different networks. So a small, you might have, and that's on and off the exchange. Mm -hmm. So you might have a product that has, you know, we were talking about different hospitals and whatever. So this, this product might come with this network. And it's different than the network that you have today if you have Blue Cross today. And other carriers might be having different networks as well. So there's a lot um, to pay attention to this year if you're <coughs> making an election for coverage effective January 1st as well. That being said with all of the uncertainty that there is, that's been one of our concerns as a, a group that's under 50 employees. You know, we do go ahead and provide insurance to our employees because we just, we think it's the right thing to do. Um, but I've heard so much about like, oh, they'll tell you that your premiums are going to be this or your rate's going to be that and then it's going to go up by at least twice as that much. Is, is, what is the chance of that, or does nobody really know because of the uncertainty that's out there? I mean, <laughs> well, we kind of well like, right now, you, you quite honestly, yeah. uh, with our groups today, right. you should know what your options are for possibly staying in, in the 2013, December of 2013, and you should know what your impact is in 2014. So you, right. you, those rates are all. Yeah, we've gotten a letter from Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, and, and all of ours have gone up, which is normal. I mean, we you know kind of expected that. We just didn't know like, are they going to go up from there? I know we got a letter and it said it's going to be this, but because of all the talk there's been, it's like, oh god, are they going to come back and say sorry, your rates are still going to go up? Or, so, so what you know, we did, okay. what we did was, what we did, we took this, and this was a real okay. challenge for Blue Cross. We okay. took the product that you were on, <laughs> that you were on today. Right. Well, we our challenge was to try and map you to the closest possible product in the new affordable, you know, a new, a new Affordable Care Act product. So from there, you may have had an increase or a decrease, and sure. we had both. Although that's not the product that necessarily you have to take, we, you could then take any of the small group products that we offer, and so you could adjust, just like you do today. Maybe you compare. Could, or what yeah, you can okay. compare and look at different, uh, different products. Yeah. But I will tell you this, yeah. the product that you may, may choose to go on in 2014, those rates are locked down. They're locked down okay. again until January so 1 of 2000. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. This lockdown in price, and, and this is something that concerns me and has from the start, this lockdown in price, because I think this whole thing's going to blow up in everybody's face. <laughs> and, and I think that, that some of the first to get hurt are going to be the insurance carriers and that the money paid out is just going to far exceed what your income is. Is there a provision that the government has offered you for like midterm rate increases? Actually, they, they did. There was an option for carriers to do a quarterly uh, adjustment. Blue Cross elected uh, to not do that. I think some of the carriers did. And I'll be honest with you, this is where I get, you get outside of my, I'm not in those circles and those decisions, I'll just be very honest with you. So I don't know all the, th all the things that kind of, the inner workings of, of, um, of what a carrier had to do to ma ultimately make that decision, but I can tell you that Blue Cross did not. So our 2014 rates are good for a solid year and we'll make adjustments. Oddly enough, I was telling Carolyn yesterday, we have to make our adjustments by uh, the end of March 2014 for our 2015 rates. That's what uh, the rules tell us that we have to play by. So There are, there are some nuances of this, as, as Mike was saying, where different carriers might have elected different strategies going forward. And there are clearly 
sometimes different hearers interpreting the law different ways as well. So um, as complex as it is, it's, it can get more complex when you're looking at different carriers side by side and trying to understand where do I fit and, and how does this impact me. So I would just, again, be cautious and make sure you're looking at it very closely. And Did I answer your question? Did we answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> That's why we, okay. I was wondering, we've been hearing a lot about if any little thing in your plan changes and you have to go to the exchange, is that the group plan also? That, that's not, what you're talking about, that's, that's not accurate. Okay. Um, what, what, there is a provision, there was a provision called grandfather clause. And so when the Affordable Care Came Act, Affordable Care Act was passed, there were certain provisions that you were mandated to change your plan unless you grandfathered your plan and or your individual plan was grandfathered, so to speak. And if it was grandfathered, you could keep that plan. But you couldn't ever change it very much over time. So in, at your next renewal, if you made a change, your plan might not be grandfathered any longer. That's individual. That's individual and group. You can have a group that's grandfathered. You could have an individual plan that was grandfathered. Now, less and less. With all carriers. Right. And less and less plans are grandfathered than used to be because we're talking three years ago, a lot of things have changed. So employers have needed to make changes or carriers have made changes with their individual contracts. Sometimes they just decided not to offer something that was there that might have been a grandfathered plan because it didn't work for them. So there may not, you, if you have a grandfathered plan, there are certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act that don't apply, but not, not a lot, but some. And you would have um, had to stay on that plan since March 23rd of 2010. Would not right. have made any change. If you're, that's how a, a group, a, a, a individual <coughs> group. If your plan loses grandfather status, all that means is that those provisions that you didn't have to have, you now have to have in your plan. It doesn't mean you have to go to the exchange and buy coverage. So again, no one has to go to the exchange and buy coverage. No one does. If you want to get a subsidy, so if you're between 400 and 100 percent of poverty and you want to get a subsidy from the government, then you have to go to the exchange. But only if you want to get this, if you're eligible for the subsidy and if you want to get the subsidy. Now, if you're between 100 and 400 percent of poverty, the only way you're eligible for the subsidy is if you are not eligible for a plan through your employer that offers minimum essential coverage and is not affordable or adequate coverage. And there are definitions for all of those things. So if I am working for an employer and my employer offers me a plan that covers minimum essential coverage that is affordable, which means it's no more than 9.5% of my income, and it's adequate coverage, which means it meets that 60% actuarial value test, if, if I get all of those through my employer, I'm not eligible for a subsidy, no matter what my income is nor are any of my dependents eligible for the subsidy no matter what, no matter how many dependents I have and no matter what the <coughs> circumstance is. That is a major, that particular that I just said is a major flaw in the way the law was written, but it is the way the law was written and it's probably not going to be able to be changed at this current time. So again, if I am eligible for coverage that offers minimum essential, adequate and affordable, I am not eligible for a subsidy no matter what my income is, nor are my dependents, spouse and children. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to point out that subsidies are only uh, available on the individual exchange, not on the shop or that <clears throat> small group exchange. I wanted to point that out. Question. What is the poverty line? And it's my understanding that it was lowered in the last couple of years. Is that not the case? Um, the poverty is, yeah, nice. I'm sorry, it's, on the, it's in an appendix, thank you Mike, it's on an appendix at the very end here, and you can see, and it also, the, the, your subsidy depends on your family, whether you're an individual or a family of four, <coughs> but um, you can kind of see on this graph, in the CBIS presentation, it's graph 33, which is the very last page. See this presentation that looks like this, kind of, but without the writing. They did that. It looks like that. So, 
you, they did it in those little boxes. So small. Well, I can get this. This will be posted so you can look at it on the page. Page what? Please. It's page. It's page slide 33. It's the very last slide in the seat. It's slide 11. The last thing. That looks like this. Yeah. Yeah. But for an individual, um, poverty level is $11,490. And 400% of poverty is $45,960. So if I make less than $45,000, that's a lot of people. But more, but 23,550 or more, that's the group that may be eligible for a subsidy. And you can see on there um, what the subsidy might be. So I would not have to pay, if I'm at 400% of poverty, which is $45,960, I would not have to pay more than $364 a month for my car. So if you're making $15,000 a year as an individual, the max amount you would have to pay per month is $25? Correct. That's correct. And for a family of four, $52. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Very good. Sir. And these plans are available on the exchange? These are not plans. This is, subs this is a government subsidy that's available. And the government subsidy means that when you after the government subsidy, this is the most you would have to pay for insurance okay. no matter where you buy it. So you have to fit within that. Then you so you have to fit within that. And then you would get that. Correct. Correct. Just to give a little uh, little information about the subsidy and how that is, how that actually, uh, the inner workings of how that goes about. If, it's a, if an individual was to go on the uh, healthcare.gov when it's up and working, you would actually go through a, uh, a subsidy application. You've got to put in all your information and then once that is determined you then go back to uh, potentially maybe go back to the carrier and you see all their plans or you would potentially stay out on the government site and then you'd be able to see all the plans and how much it costs you minus the subsidy amount. So you'd see actually direct cost of how much it would, it would actually cost you after the subsidy has been applied. Now the subsidy itself is not something that actually is given to a, an individual. The subsidy then, let's face it, then what will happen is the, the individual will then pay the carrier the amount that their responsibility is, then the federal government then pays the, the health insurance carrier, the other portion. So that's actually how things then become whole uh, to pay for the entire policy. The, the um, healthcare.gov, one of the reasons why it's, as, well, first of all, it's so complicated because there was an attempt to pull a million different data elements into one place and from a million different places. So from carriers, from the IRS, from, um, from the government, from other places. So it's, it's, it was a very complex undertaking. But what, when, you go, when you went to the website, what the intent was, is that you know you keep talking about it like you're going to be able to shop just like you do on Amazon.com. Well, when you go on Amazon.com or you know whatever, you can see all these different things and how much they cost. You can compare and contrast and and the intent in my mind when we were going to go to the exchange and be able to shop, I was going to be able to put in my information and then I would see Blue Cross costs this and it costs this, Coventry costs this, whatever. Or Blue Cross has these ten options and it has these ten and whatever. So I'd be able to see all these options. I could filter it however I wanted, like I, I want to filter things with high deductible and I want this doctor in my plan and whatever. So I'd be able to filter it and then bring up and then I'd get to choose and I'd fill out the application and, and would move on. The way this, the, this site has been designed is that you answer, you, you put in first your, your name, your zip code, where you live, and your salary. So I'm putting in, I make $34,470. And then it asks me to set up an account. So I'm setting up an account. It asks that information. And then it asks me to, to create an account. So it wants a username and a password. And it wants me to answer security questions. It gives me a choice of about 10 security questions. I can select three. And I'm to put in the answers to those security questions. When I put in the answers to the security questions and I have my username or password, and then I click continue, I'm supposed to be able then to go what they're then going to do is tell me whether I'm eligible for a subsidy or not. So before they show me the retail price, they're going to tell me that I'm eligible for 
for a certain subsidy. And so when I look at the retail price, it's not going to be any more than $121 or $193 when I go look at it per month. If you look at the retail price, it might be totally different for you because you make $75,000 and therefore it's going to be, you're going to see a different number and a different price for the exact same product than I do because I'm getting a subsidy and you're not. So the idea was that everyone would be able to see the subsidy, which would take the sticker shock away from those who are least able to afford it. Um, the problem with it is that that's very complex and just the idea that even anybody who wanted to just go see what's out there, hey, I have coverage through my employer, but I still want to just go see what it's like, everyone's going out there to see what it is, and you have to set up this account, and that's kind of crashed the system. As far as I've gotten, and I tried multiple times, as far as I've gotten is that twice after I put in all that information, it told me that my username was not available. Well, a lot of times when you're using a system and you put your username in, right then it'll tell you this name is not available. But this system requires you to answer all the questions, then it tells you it's not available. Then it wipes out the information that you put in, so you have to start all over and put the information in again. And so I only got that far twice before I decided that I wasn't going to spend my time doing that any for any longer. Now, that's those are the the Thanks. kinds of problems that are out there, and that's why it is what it is today. So yes. Is there a browser issue? I don't think it was ever beta tested. That's it, well, I can I can tell you that my insurance carrier partners have have uh, confirmed that there was not a lot of testing done, and even up to three weeks before, they were continuing to tell us we we've done one test on one something, and that's all that we were allowed to do. So, and I, I do think the insurance carriers. I think someone said the insurance carriers are going to get the blame. I think the insurance carriers are going to get get a lot of blame in this process, and I really think to a certain extent. I've watched them from my perspective. Um, they have, their, their world has been turned upside down in a very short amount of time. Everything that they've done <coughs> has to be done a different way. And so um, I really feel like they've worked as hard as they possibly can to be compliant and to get, get products out there that are compliant and that are priced appropriately in a world where it's un there are a lot of unknowns. So even what should the price be, it's, it's, although there's an actuarial science to it, where a lot of, there's a lot of shooting in the dark because things have changed so drastically. Certainly so. not alone. I mean, yeah. everyone in this room has also affected every broker. I just have to know Blue Cross and Blue Shield. They have to know uh, multiple carriers. So it's, 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 it's complex for all of us. Did you have a question? Sorry. I'm sorry, I have another question. Please, that's why um, we're here. If you are a part of the Affordable Care Act, with the um, exchange, I guess. We are. And I have to pay in um, two hundred dollars a month. How much does the government give your company for me? Well, it's based on the full cost. You take the full cost of the policy, your portion, and then the subsidy portion, because some may even go out to the to the exchange and they're not subsidy eligible, but they're still going to choose to buy their product through the exchange, and let's just say it's $600. Well, they're going to pay $600 to the insurance carrier. In a subsidy situation, you're only paying $200, the federal government's going to turn around and pay us $400. So the cost itself is going to still remain the same, but there will just be variances based on your subsidy eligibility. So until I question. become ill, the insurance company does okay, because like um, the people in our company who are on Medicare, they will pay like $140 every month. And the government will pay that carrier $780 or something like that every month. Mm -hmm. Where do they get that money from? Taxpayers? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they look at uh, the additional taxes. But, that's a, that, but your question is a good one because um, what's happening now is, again, when I used to sign up for insurance, I would send my money either through my employer or directly to the carrier. Now my money might come from two different places. If I'm eligible for a subsidy, I might owe part, and the federal government owes part for me. So that information has to get to Blue Cross that Carolyn Watley signed up for coverage. She's eligible for $400 of subsidy. Here's the $400 that's for Carolyn, and you should expect the $200 from Carolyn. And so they're going to have to match that up in their system and all that is again a whole new set of information that's going back and forth so um, it's and right now because 
because of the system issues, uh, I know the carriers have been informed that for a while they're not going to know who signed up for their <laughs> coverage because that information they can't <coughs> yet transfer it. So I might have signed up on the on the web, but Blue Cross doesn't yet know that I'm one of their clients. And so if I have a claim, perhaps in January, and I go to the doctor, I'm not I'm not trying to scare anyone because that's not the case. But I I think expect glitches while this is being while this is unfolding because it's new. It's new for everyone. There's a lot of pieces to it, a lot of moving parts, and so um, it's going to uh, be be some rough waters at the beginning, yes, and I think everyone agrees with that, yes. Well, we still we'll have like our insurance cards that we take to, okay, so like as of January 1st, if you're, you're, you have a new system or your new healthcare, will those be issued in a timely fashion? Because we're just talking about, if you go to, you know, your doctor or whatever, Trick is question. It going <laughs> to be, you know, are we going to be covered at that point? I mean, yeah. Well, no, you know, I, I really kind of dovetail on what she just now said, yeah. and that is, in a perfect world, that's exactly right. We know that you're enrolled, you've purchased insurance, we send you your uh, ID card, and you're set to go. If we don't get that transmission, and we're un unaware of exactly what's going on, obviously you're going to be going, what's going on, Blue Cross? I'm now being denied. And that's where some of that blame game is going to come. It, it really is. We're going to, it's going to happen. Uh, we potentially, could, it could happen. But... Um, that's just part of the challenge. You all look healthy to me. So as, as a small business, if I go in and I choose to buy a package through the exchange and I get with Blue Cross Blue Shield mm -hmm. or Coventry or whoever, do I still have a rep so that when I get ridiculous questions that make my eyes roll in the back of my head, we, I can pass We it. hope so because Blue Cross of Kansas City, we work through our broker community. That's really kind of how we are structured. So we hope so, and if you're not, Okay. <laughs> I've got one right here for you. Okay. Well, I just didn't know how that the representative. Absolutely. Work. Absolutely. And just so you know, we we get paid yeah. um, if we That's assist fine. you in buying coverage on the exchange or off of the exchange, either one. The same. And just the what it's worth, it's the same so, too. Now there are other people out there. There's a new category of helpers called navigators. You might have heard about navigators. <laughs> And navigators are a new term, and there's an assister as well, so there's another category. A navigator is someone who gets paid by the hour by the federal government to help you but not advise you. So to kind of help you walk through the process but not to tell you which plan to select. And they have different requirements and, it, and uh, on their training than a broker or a consultant would. Um, but they're, that's another category of folks who are out there to help. But those are really to help you get enrolled, not necessarily after the fact to help right. you service your, your account. And I would just say, you know, this is all so complex, and it gets more complex every day. There was a new rule in the last few days about the ability to roll over another $500 on your Section 125 plan, and you may have heard something about that. It's nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act, but it's another complexity at a very um, – inopportune time for all of us who are trying to just get through where we are right now. But that's a whole other issue that you should be aware of, you should know about it, and think about whether or not that's something that you want to do with your plan if you do have a Section 125 plan. I think you had a question, yes? No. Did you call? Me? No, I, I, okay, we'll get back to you. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's my understanding, there's several states that actually did set up their own exchange. Is it your opinion, like, the government kind of assumed that more states were going to set up their own exchange, and then when there were a lot more states that didn't set up an exchange, right. then that may have been what's caused all this problems with the government. Uh, from an outsider looking in, I'm going to say yes to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we've, I mean, on the television side, we've seen the advertising going on in California and other states sure. where they've set up their own exchange, and there's providers promoting their own products and encouraging people to go to right. those. And so of, they're not experiencing the same. Some problems. of them are. Some of them are not. And some of them are. I read okay. a headline yesterday that Oregon is in worse shape than the federal mm -hmm. marketplace. So I don't know anything about their too. marketplace, but yeah. um, I think again, depending on how they were each set up and what was involved in setting them up, some of them are working very well, and some of them not are also having issues. It's a you know it's again it's a complex thing that was attempted. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so we're all blazing new trails. Yeah, yes. blazing new trails. That's right. Oh, um, what what marketplace reforms, like for a small business, what changes in our plan are we going to see? Is there a short list or is there a list in here and I can just... Yes. Which one are you grabbing? We both have, we, we, we both have, uh, we 
both have a lot of the same information. If you go kind of to this um, Good. Good. slide number four on the CD's presentation, let's kind of start with. Um, But this timeline just kind of tells you the the various things that have occurred so far. So back in 2010, you can see changes that were made. You've heard a lot about dependent stage 26, so a dependent can stay on your parents' plan under your group to up to age 26, and you can see the list preventive services with no cost sharing were required. And as you go through the timeline, you can see the 2014, and that's where the individual mandate, so that's everyone has to have coverage or you pay a fine. The individual insurance marketplace begins, coverage, so the first effective dates would be January 1st, even though you can enroll in, in October, the first effective dates are January 1st. Um, the cost sharing begins, the marketplace subsidy. So 90 day mi maximum waiting period, that's for any employer. So you can no longer have a waiting period that exceeds 90 days. So some people might have had six month waiting period or four months or who knows, different waiting periods for different groups of people. Sometimes you had, you know, categories of people get this waiting period and other categories something different, but you can no longer have a waiting period that exceeds 90 days. We talked about the annual limits, no annual limits, no pre-existing conditions. There are taxes that are required to be paid that the insurance company has to pay. They're passing those along to you. So on your bill, you will see this is the amount of your coverage. Here's what the taxes are that we are required to pay. So um, they can show those to you as well. There are wellness outcome based reward limits. Um, so basically if you have a wellness plan and you require employees to do certain things to get wellness dollars, there's a, a maximum amount. Or for example, if I have to do certain things, I have to pay more premium and there's a certain maximums as to exactly what you can require in that regard. And um, there's coverage for individuals participating in approved <coughs> clinical trials. That's something new for all plans effective 2014. Um, annual enrollment count reporting by insurers and self-funded plans. There's the, um, along with the employer mandate that was delayed a year, the employer reporting was delayed a year as well. And the employer reporting was going to be that database that says, here are all the employees that work for Blue Cross Blue Shield or work for CBIS or work for your company. Here are all their names. Here's um, who's covered, who's not covered, who's eligible. So when I go to get the subsidy, the government would have some database that's, that knows if I say, oh, I don't work for an employer and I'm not eligible for anything at my employer, and they have a, they have a way of turning around and saying, no, it looks like you're employed at CBIS and it looks like you are eligible for a plan and therefore you're not entitled to a subsidy. So all that information was supposed to be provided by employers and they have delayed that for a year. So, you know, the, you've heard a lot about um, no verification of the subsidy information and that um, basically when you sign your tax return, you're going to certify that the information on there is correct and that if you received a subsidy, if you received a subsidy and it turns out it was too much of a subsidy, you're supposed to give it back when you file your tax return. And um, one of the reasons the subsidy could be too much is if I got a raise mid-year, congratulations, now I'm making a lot more, and technically I worked myself out of being eligible for a subsidy. And if I got a subsidy and it's still coming in, I'm supposed to return that when I file my taxes and pay that back. So for all the accountants out there, they'll have a, a lot more complexities when they're doing your filing That's your taxes sure. in 2014. In theory, the system is supposed to allow you to, uh, if you do get that raise, in theory, you're supposed to be able to go out, make those adjustments online, and therefore reduce your, your subsidy amount. There are, so addition, you don't get caught in that potential. In addition to, yeah, and that's another thing this whole massive system is supposed to be able to keep track of. So again, it's a lot to keep track of. There are some reporting requirements as well. So there are notices that you're required to give employees. The notice that there is a marketplace and that it's out there was required before October the 1st. Every single employer was supposed to notify every single employee, full-time, part-time, eligible, ineligible of the marketplace and so if you haven't done and then you're also supposed to do that for every new employee um, within 14 days 
and there's a summary of benefits and coverage that started in 2012, you can see on the timeline, that employers are required to give employees about their plan as well. So there are a lot of different reporting requirements as well as plan provisions that are, are required as part of the Affordable Care Act. Will there be any changes, like let's say um, I start a new job, but like in my current employer, my insurance didn't kick in for like 30 days or something. So with this, will it have to now start effective immediately or will all of that kind of still stay the same? The employer can still have a 90 day waiting period. Okay. You would have COBRA like you had before, or you can go to the marketplace and buy insurance or outside the marketplace. So you just need to buy an individual policy or extend your COBRA from your prior employer for- Still options out there for you. So as I'm hearing this, I'm just kind of summarizing. If you oh, have an employer plan, <laughs> you, can get it, you can get insurance through your employer, or you can go out and buy it through an agent off the marketplace, or you can go on the marketplace, and you have three, three options, kind of. But what about people who are 65 or older and have Medicare? What does Obamacare do for them? There's no change. No change. No change. Yeah. So they, as a, and I, and I don't mean that because I honestly, uh, Medicare is not my strength at all. I know that there is some changes within the, within the, the context of the law, though of, 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 of shrinking the donut hole with prescription drugs, and I don't know all the details uh, surrounding that. But uh, there are some changes in reimbursement that providers get who are caring for Medicare, for Medicare sure. patients okay. uh, as part of it. But essentially, the uh, those who are eligible for Medicare are would still stay on Medicare. And um, if you're eligible for Medicare, you're also not eligible for a subsidy. If you're eligible for Medicaid, you're not eligible for a subsidy. If you're eligible for the CHIPS plan, you're not eligible for a subsidy. If you're an illegal immigrant, you're not eligible for a subsidy. So. Um, if there's a family member that's on Medicare, but the other family member is not and is not covered, can they still apply on the marketplace to get a subsidy for their own insurance and their yes. job? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. As long as they meet that, um, as long as they meet that income definition and are not eligible for coverage through their employer. But Everything are they going to take the family income really into good. consideration for that, though? There is a household income as well. Even but again, if one of the people is on Medicare. Yes. Okay. Yes. So they would still have to count that person's income even if they were on disability? Correct. Correct. Did I hear you say dependents? So if I have an employee and they get health insurance for me, but they want their spouse, they don't want the group's insurance, <coughs> they can't go to the market. Or they can't get a subsidy. They can go to the marketplace, but they can't get a subsidy. Can't get the okay. subsidy. If they're eligible under your employer's plan. Mm -hmm. Now, you're hearing a lot about employers not um, including spouses as eligible categories of people. So um, some employers are doing that. Um, I've been in this business for 36 years. First time I've ever heard of anybody doing that is in the last few months. So that's a fairly new phenomenon where employers, some are saying no spouses are eligible. Some are saying spouses are not eligible for our plan if they're eligible for their own employer plan. Because under the Affordable Care Act, we think it's their employer's responsibility to provide them coverage, not ours. And so um, if your spouse is not eligible for your plan, the spouse could be eligible for a subsidy. I actually have never seen that in writing. That's what I've been told actually by um, others. Yeah, but, well, that's um, how Blue Cross is I'm still waiting to see that in writing because I, it's not in the law that I can yeah. write. And now you can buy the insurance on the marketplace or through a broker, even if you're, so if your employee offers it that you don't want their insurance, you can go out on the marketplace. You just don't get a government subsidy. Correct. Correct. Because we're now hiring people in other states, and it gets kind of hard for our insurance to cover them very well. So it's one of the things we're trying to do. I feel like I'm going to change topic a little bit, because one of the things that I'm looking at is paying or playing. Yes. And um, if I choose not to play and choose to accept the penalties, but half of my employees have gone out to the exchange. If I am encouraging the exchange and I get 65 of my 85 employees to go out, am I paying penalties on them even though they have insurance? 
There so are, it doesn't matter. So yeah. I get just railed no matter what. There are two different penalties. Okay. There's one penalty if you don't offer minimum essential coverage to your employees. Right. And if you don't do that, you pay $2,000 per full-time employee. So if you have 50 employees, $2,000 times 50 employees. Do you get 30, you get 30 of those? You get 30 Minus of those? Minus the first 30. Yeah. Minus, Minus the, the first, first, 30. first 30. Correct. Even though I may have half of those employees that say, yeah, I don't need insurance. I don't want it. Correct. Correct. Then if, you, if the coverage that you do offer is not affordable or adequate, which means 60% actuarial value, right. or it's not affordable, you pay $3,000 per impacted employee who receives a subsidy. So it's very confusing, complex. What it means is I don't have any penalty unless one of my employees goes to the exchange and gets a subsidy. For example, if all of my employees are more than 400% of poverty, i.e., they all if every employee I have makes more than 50,000, there's no penalty that can be applied because nobody can go get a subsidy. Right. Because everybody's not eligible for a subsidy. But, but say if, I, if I have a lot if all my employees, employees will all my, be in right. that. If all my employees make 30,000 and they all go to the exchange and they all get a subsidy, I would pay 3,000 times the number of people that went there and got a subsidy. Or the 2,000, whichever is less. So it's not advantageous to tell them, hey, go get, go out to the exchange and there's subsidies out there for you. That's not advantageous. Well, not unless this cost is less yeah, than what you were paying a year for more. <laughs> I think that, um, right. again, if you think about it compared to what am I doing today, what you really, what, what one thing that you were just talking about is, hey, it, this can still be cheaper. I'm going to drop it and let it go. Right. Well, that's an option. Um, you could also, what's being kind of, uh, to me, and again, I'm a benefit consultant, so keep that in mind. I'm biased. But um, to me, to pay a fine and get nothing in return is, to some degree, a waste of money when you could be using those same dollars to do something for your employees that you value. So I would suggest that in, in the future, one of the um, terms that you'll hear is a defined contribution plan. So in the past, I might have said to my employees, I'll pay 100% of whatever the single coverage is, or I'll pay 80% of whatever the single coverage is. And in the future, it, you could say, I'll pay X, and I'll let all, and you're eligible for X, and we have a plan that meets minimum essential coverage. It's adequate. It's affordable for the lowest level of our associates. It's no more than 9.5. So what I'm going to contribute requires you to pay no more than 9.5% of your income, so the lowest level person. And then you can decide what kind of option you want. And the carriers might have 12 different options to pick from. I don't have to pick just one for everybody. I can basically say, you guys, to a certain degree, go shopping within our own plan with the carrier, having nothing to do with the marketplace. You could still do that on the marketplace, but outside of the marketplace, and that would be called a defined contribution plan. So your contribution could keep you from having to pay those penalties, still be offering a benefit to your employees and their dependents to a certain degree. And um, you can weigh, then for example, as healthcare costs go up and inflation increases, the employee m might be paying more of the future increases um, instead of you. Or you might increase your contribution and, and kind of share that as you go along. But it puts you a little bit more in the driver's seat than you have been in the past in terms of what you want to contribute. And that's really, I think, the coming where the future is going to be. Okay. So Divine contribution. You'll yep. start seeing that a lot in the future. Keeps and again, the more carriers... controlling you with, your, uh, with uh, your finances. And the carriers have done a great job of rolling out lots of different options, lots of different plans, and in addition, decision-making tools to help you decide. So for example, it's kind of like your 401k, and we all have maybe our employers contributing a certain amount. We are as well, and now we go, oh, wait a minute, where am I going to put my money? And the, um, the carriers or the plan sponsors have created tools that basically say, I'm X years old, I'm female, I have this risk tolerance, and I have this income, whatever. And so it might recommend the types of uh, different assets that I put my 401k contribution in. So in the future, you might see decision-making tools that, hey, I have this illness, this illness, uh, a lot of expenses associated with it. I live here. 
I'm female, I'm whatever, help me pick which plan design, and I'm on these prescription drugs or whatever, and I like this doctor, help me pick the plan that's best for me, and it might come up with a recommendation. You can still choose whatever plan you want, but it, it provides decision-making tools to help people make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. We can take one or two more questions, and then we're going to have to bring it to a close. Any final questions? I'll throw one. I was waiting for everyone else to do your last question. Uh, go, go back to that tax component, because you mentioned there was kind of a dynamic shift from insurance company picking up tax burden, and that's going to be moved back to uh, individual recipient of the insurance plan how's from a tax standpoint if we're picking up the tax is that something we're going to be able to write off at the end of the year do you know anything about that well some of the taxes that uh, she was referring to is actually paid for by the carrier we pay for them and ultimately at the end of the day though we are passing them on in the form of higher premiums and so that would not be something that an individual would then be able to to write off Will I, have a, will I have my premium though, and then at the bottom of my bill plus a tax? Or will well, my premiums just include the cost of that tax? You know, I tell you what, I, carriers are doing it differently. Okay. So, and I know Blue Cross initially started out uh, with some of our some of our most recent renewals. We wanted to show you exactly, and so we were showing you here's what Blue Cross is giving you as your annual renewal increase. And here's what the impact of the Affordable Care Act, and here's what your total is. Mm -hmm. So we was breaking it out. We 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 have made we've kind of gone back and forth of how we're going to move it uh, in in the future, whether we're going to continue to break it out or not. And I don't I can't speak for other carriers though. Okay. So. Yeah, and as Mike said, the tax is required to pay pay by the insurance carrier, so it's not an individual tax that you can write off. Now, um, if you are a self-employed individual and you are buying individual insurance. The premium for yourself, you know, for the plan that you would buy, you can, um, you know, write off as a business expense the way you normally would as a self-employed individual. If you are not a self-employed individual but you buy the individual insurance, <coughs> it's only um, it's, you can you can record the cost on Schedule A only to the extent that it includes that 7.5 percent of your income or 10 percent. It's now a new change. So if your expenses exceed that amount of your income, then you can put it on the amount that exceeds that on Schedule A and, and have a deduction for that. But um, for the most part, you're paying for those with after-tax. You're paying your premium with after-tax dollars if you're buying it on, as an individual. And that's another thing that I think employers need to think about when you're thinking about, do I want to send my employees over there or do I want to provide coverage? Because when you're providing coverage for them or providing a benefit, that is a tax favored benefit to your employees. And so if you're contributing 2000 that's worth more than 2000 to the employee who's receiving that, which is pretty significant. If you say, here's 2000 in cash, some of that just got turned into taxes, and the rest of it is now dollars that I have to spend on whatever I choose to spend. And the other thing I would caution employers, again, everyone's supposed to have health insurance, but um, what you don't want is an employee who has something happen and doesn't have health insurance and can't get back to work to can't get can't get healed and get back to work in a timely fashion as well. So, is that used for employees or is that changed? I'm sorry. I that used for reporting is that for 250 or more employees or has that changed? That has not changed. So if you have 250 more, it's not 250 employees. It's 250 W2s. So in an organization that has a lot of turnover might have 100 employees, but 250 or more W-2s. If you have 250 more or more W-2s, you have to report the value of the benefits on the W-2 in box 12, I think it is. Um, and it's very, we've, I've had three hour seminars on what goes in that box, so it's also complicated. But I want to thank you all for your attendance and your questions. We really appreciate it. Jasmine, help me out. I know that you were going to make these presentations available because I know some of them, it's small print. How is that going to happen? We can see if we can put these online. Absolutely. Okay. And in that way, everyone can have access to it.
it along with the handouts as well. And I just want to thank Carolyn and Mike for presenting on this much needed topic. I also learned myself, so <laughs> thank you for that. I want to thank you all for attending. Please remember to fill out your survey cards and you can leave them at your seats. And then I hope to see everyone at our December 4th business class, which is presented with Denise Cruz from Adams Gabbard. So hope to see you there. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Make one more quick announcement. Um, two things. I'm the new small business director.